What's going on, everyone? It's Sheena, a.k.a. Sheena Panua, your favorite veteran. I am your GovCon authority. So for those who are new here, welcome. I wanted to go over brand new to GovCon. Let's just say that you're brand new. It's your first video with me, or maybe you just need to get a couple of steps realigned. I want to go over just like a, not a really in-depth video, but I just want to kind of go over if you're brand new to government contracting or brand new to contracting period, here are some of the things for you to use to get started in understanding for government contracting right after the intro. Hey everyone, welcome to my channel. Here on the Sheenapreneur channel, I share information about government contracting, veteran business content, and other business tips. So if you're brand new to government contracting, welcome to like the easiest way to build wealth because I feel like government contracting is one of the easiest ways to build wealth. I've done a lot of different types of businesses throughout my entire life, even when I was a kid. So I would go on to say that it's my favorite. It's the one that gives you the most wealth and I've been doing it really for the past 10 years, but I've had my company for the past seven years, Foresight Industries. So I just wanna cover a couple of things to get you to understand like, pretty much what is government contracting or a few things that you need to make sure that you understand when you're getting into it. So the first thing is what is government contracting, right? So on the surface, again, this is surface. This is not in depth. If you need in depth, then I have a course that teaches you about federal, local and corporate contracting. But for the purposes of this video, this is going to be just kind of like going over what you kind of need to know to understand what government contracting is conceptually. So what is it? The federal government has uh, spending dollars that they need to spend with small, well, large businesses, small businesses in order to procure services and products. So they have a spend that they want to have. And when I say a spend, that means that the government says, OK, there's a trillion dollars we got to spend with businesses in order to get whatever service, whether it's an invention, whether it's a product for war, whether it's, it's janitorial services, whether it's it's event planning services. We have to spend this money with another company. We're not going to do it internally, especially when it comes to like you're thinking about the Department of Defense, DOD, which is the Army, Navy, um, you know, agencies like that where they need to spend money with with businesses, with local businesses and large corporations in order to get their mission done. So that's the federal government needs to spend money with companies in order to meet their mission. So on the local side, local contracting, which is still government contracting, contrary to popular belief, um, that's the state's version of the same thing. So usually not all, not all funding dollars, but most funding dollars come from the federal government and trickles down to the state government. But the unique thing about most state agencies, or I guess really all of them, is that they have other money to spend. They have taxpayer dollars, they have grants, they have other things that other ways that they can have money in order to procure services and products as well. And they buy everything from um, paper towel to janitorial services to pressure washing services to awards to event planning, to bottles of water, anything you can think of the government buys. There's almost nothing that the government doesn't buy unless it's illegal or risque. They're not gonna usually buy those type of services or um, anything that's illegal. So um, a few people have actually asked me about marijuana. The government is not on board yet, <laughs> whether it's federal or local. Then you have corporate contracting, which is the same but different because these are agency, corporate agencies that are like your Coca-Cola, your AT&T, T-Mobile, Boeing, any large company you could think of um, in the Fortune 500, Fortune 1000, where that has you know multiple locations and headquarters, and they need to also procure services and products from smaller businesses or even large businesses or even have partnerships. Um, so even like Coca-Cola, they do local bottling where that's why you're able to have access to so many, so much Coca-Cola because they have local bottlers who bottle the Coca-Cola wherever in the world that they are selling Coca-Cola, which is, I think, pretty much everywhere. Um, so stuff like that where they need a smaller company or another local company to um, help them with that instead of just sending directly from one warehouse, they have all these different things. And the same thing with Amazon, right, where they have hubs where like where warehouses throughout the whole world essentially where you can get your delivery locally and fast if you've ever done amazon fresh you know that that's you know you usually get it from the local whole foods or whatever i forgot what is it whole foods yeah whatever <laughs> um, so that they have locally or whatever warehouse they have locally and that's what they do corporate agencies spend money with um, diverse suppliers which diverse means 
woman owned, veteran owned, minority owned, that type of thing. Um, and even LGBTQ, they actually, um, that's a corporate certification. It doesn't cross over to the government. Um, well, it might cross over to local, but not, not federal, not yet anyway. So, um, they have a certain amount of dollars that they want to spend as well with, with smaller companies in order to expand their reach. It's a little easier for these agencies to use another company rather than hiring internally and, you know, paying taxes on that person and training and all those things. It might be easier for them to just sub that work out. And you're going to do a great job because if you don't, you're out of here. And then there's another company lined up ready to do um, work with them. So that's what government contracting is, even though I included corporate contracting. It's essentially the same type of process where you got to go through a whole vetting process and get certified and all these other things. So speaking of certifications, um, certifications is something that a lot of people ask me about. And you have your federal certifications, which are 100 percent free, 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 free. free. OK, woman owned um, service disabled veteran owned uh veteran owned which is not you know not the service disabled one but the VOSB um you have your 8A 8A um certification you have your hub zone um certification and there's a couple others um just throughout but those are the main certifications that you have. I don't think I missed any in this particular instance. And then you have the EDWOSB, which is Economically Disadvantaged Woman-Owned Small Business Certification. All those certifications are free on the federal side. And that just means that the government wants to set aside out of those, let's just say it's a trillion dollars that they're spending with small businesses to procure services and products. Um, they have a certain percentage that they're supposed to set aside for all these disadvantaged persons, the woman owned businesses, the veteran owned businesses. So if there's an agency, you know, it's, it's, it's broken down by agency. So it's like 5%, every agency is supposed to adhere to that percentage. So for example, the department of the army is going to award 5% supposed to not, it's not really mandatory. It's like they really, really supposed to, right? So they're supposed to award 5% of all their contracts to service disabled veteran owned small businesses. It used to be 3%. It just got changed to 5% for service disabled veteran owned. Woman owned is uh, 5% as well. Um, so they have to set aside that amount of contracts to those disadvantaged groups. So are they, do they do it every time? Not every time, but for the most part, for the um, SD, VOSB, and for women owned, they usually meet the mark, but hub zone is where they usually fall short. They don't usually find a lot of hub zone certified companies that they can sub, uh, give work to. So just, just something to keep in mind. So that's certifications, uh, on the federal side. On the local side, there are certifications that you, it would be advantageous for you to have because a lot of companies, like larger companies, cannot get a contract without a certified company. For example, um, especially let's just say here in Georgia to make it easy for me, for me to remember. Um, but we have the DBE, which is a disadvantaged business enterprise DBE. And these are all free again. So, and they also, in some States, they have the MBE minority business enterprise. So that's tricky because the M, there's an MBE on the corporate side that you have to pay for, but we're talking about local right now and they have a local MBE and you have to get certified usually, or sometimes you just check the box and say, yes, I'm a female owned company. Yes, I'm a um, veteran owned company. Yes, I'm a minority owned company. And notice I didn't say minority on the federal side. Federal side does not have a minority certification. Only have the 8A, which was the closest thing, but that has been changed. Now it's not necessarily minority because, you know, woman owned business can get an 8A. And now it's kind of open to most people as long as those people can um, prove that they are disadvantaged. So that's probably a topic for another video, but 8A. It's not a minority certification, so you can't just automatically get it because you're black anymore. It used to be like that, but now you can't. On the local side, if anyone tells you you have to pay for a certification, pretty much sure they're lying. If, if I'm wrong, correct me in the comments, but those local certifications, I've never seen one where you had to pay for it. Now you may pay for it if you want a third party to do it for you, which I would strongly recommend against because if you, if you do that, people have access to all of your personal information. And some of these, a lot of these certifications require like your birth certificate, your passport, like your really high sensitive documents. So I, I would just go ahead and say, take the time, 
to do the certification yourself. So at least you know what right looks like and you can do more certifications, but you really don't want to have people have access to your information like that. Especially a lot of times you get people that you don't even know. And it's like, don't do that. Don't do that. Just do your own certification. It takes a minute, but the good thing about certifications is it gets you straight because if you have a hard time doing the certifications, that means that you didn't have the documents to begin with, which is a problem because a lot of times you'll have to provide that stuff anyway. So anyway, certification on the local side are also free. Or you may not have to get a certification, you just have to check a box on that particular solicitation to say that you are one of these designations. Corporate side, corporate certifications you have to pay for, and they vary. I mean, they could be $150 every two years up to and exceeding $500 per year. Now, will you get a return on your invest investment? Maybe, maybe not. I mean, I, there's, I can't tell you that, yes, one is going to work over another, I don't know because I may have just been in the wrong state and this particular state did not care about the certification and, and making sure that companies got the work. And again, we're talking about corporate. So these are corporate agencies. These are your AT&Ts and Boeings and, and Coca-Cola and Facebook and stuff like that. So it's not really up to the agency that's doing the certification. They can't guarantee you anything. No one can guarantee you anything, right? But you know, these certifications that you have to pay for, you just got to make sure before you go into paying for a certification, make sure you're going to go into corporate contracting. You may not ever go into corporate contracting and then you're over here paying. You may not ever go that route. You might stick to local contracting or stick to federal and never go over to, to corporate and then you pay for a certification and it's only good for a year and now you're just it's just sitting there. So I would strongly recommend you not doing that until you know you're ready. Next thing would be uh, a government contracting is selling, and I kind of mentioned this earlier, selling products and services to the government. And this, it could be anything, event services, it could be uh, laptops, it could be even photography, it could be anything. So just keep in mind, um, start with what you know. I would say start with what you know or and or with someone that you can actually use in this contract. So for me, I didn't know anything about flooring when I first started, but I had a contractor that I was doing real estate with. Now, I guess I knew about flooring, but I didn't really know, like really know. And um, but I knew that he could build a house or a building from the ground up. So I used my contractor and I knew his expertise was there. And so stick to what you know or what you know you can use. So if you have someone that you trust, again, I if you're new here, you wouldn't know how, my, how many rants I've gone on about starting with what you know. Um, but people don't do that and then they end up in a bad situation. So you going after just rando things is highly dangerous. I would strongly recommend starting with what you know, starting what you can understand. Or if you're going into like, say, um, selling paper products, at the end of the day, it's paper products. It's not, it can't be that hard, but there may be some gaps that you don't understand. And I would say with those gaps, usually if something seems simple. Let's say you're delivering paper products. Weather and logistics are going to be the thing that you have to like, okay, let me, let me take into account weather and logistics because the pricing may already be there because the agency tells you um, exactly where to get the products from. So it might be easy, but then you're like, okay, well, how am I going to get this to this location? Is uh, who I'm buying it from? Are they going to deliver it? What if it rains? What if the stuff gets wet? Like, you know, all those types of things you have to think about when it comes to products and then services. You may not know the gaps, even with janitorial that everyone swears is so easy. There may be, you know, you might use bleach and most agencies do not allow bleach because you didn't read your contract thoroughly or something like that. So just make sure you're keeping in mind what you're going into so it doesn't become more money for you to spend because I've had to do that where my subcontractor didn't really understand certain things and it cost me more money. Well, it cost him more money because I charged him, but I don't even want to deal with the aggravation. I just want things to go nice and smooth. And so knowing those gaps make it so much easier for you to move forward. So when I talked earlier about um, the different agencies that procure services and products, there's so many agencies out there. If you think about federal, a lot of people just think about Department of the Army or Department of the Navy and all the DODs, but there's Department of Interior, there's the USDA, and the USDA actually crosses over to local as well. It's local and federal, ironically. I don't know why, but there's, you know, so many agencies and sub-agencies like HHS. If you ever heard of the CDC um, Center for Disease Control, I think we all kind of got understood what the CDC was um, during COVID, but it falls under HHS, which is probably an agency you haven't heard of. Um, which is health and human services. So there's so many different agencies 
that um, that are in existence on the federal side. And then on the local side, you have your state contracts, which is like the state of Georgia, the state of Texas, the state of Alaska. And then you have um, the Georgia, the Fulton County school system. The school system itself is a whole separate sector that's under the state system. So you got your state, you got your school systems, and then you have the county. So it might just be DeKalb County or um, Gwinnett County, Georgia, or something, you know, a county that's uh, underneath the state. And then you have the individual cities. So at city of Atlanta, um, city of Snellville, city of Compton, you know, whatever it is. Um, and they have their own system as well. So the, the rough thing about doing the state contracts, I will say Georgia has a very, very good procurement website where it will show nearly all of the contracts available for the state of Georgia. And I'll put a link in the description site link but it shows almost all of them. So it shows the school systems, the state, the state of Georgia, the city, the county. But there's some um, states that don't have that, unfortunately. So you have to just register in each city in the area you're willing to travel. Um, each state, if you want to do multiple states, each county, each school system, blah, 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 um, where, where you want to work and where you want to provide services. So also on that same token, people ask me if I'm living in Georgia, can I bid on something in another state? Absolutely. Just make sure that you can you can do a contract in that state. Like you are in Florida and you bid on a contract in Alaska. Are you going to be able to get to Alaska? Are you going to do you know people in Alaska? Like, how is that going to work? You have to think through that whole thing, not just let me bid on anything and see what sticks. Make sure that you're able to perform or you find someone that you can trust. What if that contract disappears off the face of the earth? You got to go to Alaska now or you're going to default on that contract. And if you default, you get terminated for default. That is a nail in the coffin. Nine times out of 10, you won't be able to bid on any more contracts. You know, there's always those loopholes, but pretty much you don't want to be in that situation anyway. It's high stress and we don't we don't want stress. We, we don't want wrinkles. So we don't want stress. Different federal agencies, different local agencies. Of course, as I stated earlier, there's a whole bunch of different corporations, companies you never even heard of that are billion dollar companies and they are also looking for procurement services. So you have to just kind of build relationships. And that's where the certifying agencies on the corporate side, the one you have to pay for, they're supposed to be your advocate. And they'll have a list of all the companies that are partner with them that are looking for um, diverse suppliers. So, you know, you may not ever have ever heard of this company, but they're partnered with this certifying agency on the corporate side that the one that you have to pay for. And you're like, oh, shoot, let me see if they're right here in Atlanta. Let me let me um, see if they need janitorial services or, you know, have the agency reach out on your behalf or stay in touch with whoever your contact person is for that agency because they might be like, oh, I know a person that can help with this service. So the next thing would be um, bidding. So when I when I say bidding, that means that I find an opportunity on some website, whether it's sam.gov for the federal side or one of the local websites, and they have an opportunity that looks like something I want to do. Oh, wow, they're looking for janitorial services. Um, and it's nearby. It's in the state of Georgia where I live. That's perfect. And wow, they only need one employee. I can find someone to do this for me. Then you are going to submit a bid, which means you're going to submit. Now there's RFP, request for proposal, RFQ, request for quote, they have ITB, which is an invitation to bid. And there's a few others, but those are like the three main ones. And what those do is they put out an opportunity, review it, look at the scope of work, and then you decide if you want to go after it. And all of these opportunities have a date on them. They have um, like a last day to ask the agency questions, depending on when you find this opportunity, you may be too late to ask questions or whatever. I still ask questions, even if it's too late, just in case, <laughs> if it's something I really want to pursue. But nine times out of 10, they're going to tell you it's too late to ask questions. But let's say you make it in time to ask questions. You go over through the whole solicitation, like, okay, there's issues, like there's things I need to know. You ask those questions and the agency is supposed to respond. They have to, they have to respond by essentially by law. Um, and so you put in a proposal, whether it's on the local side, typically you're not gonna need a proposal. And if it's a RFQ, which is a request for quote on the federal side or on the local side, that usually just means they want numbers. They want you to fill out these documents to show that you're a legit business. They want the number, that's it. 
every now and then you might have to do a proposal. You have to write out like the technical approach and how you're going to do it and your past experience and all these other things. Um, so you just have to look at that and read the instructions, read the whole thing through. Some of the stuff is going to be redundant and some of it's going to be jargon where they have two or three pages of just definitions. <laughs> so don't get stuck on that. I would say always go to the scope of work first. So you look at the date first, because if it's due today, there's no need of me even looking at it. But you look at the date first, the title, and then the scope of work. And if the scope of work is like, uh, no way I'm doing this. And just don't even read anything else. Just get rid of it. And then you start reading the rest of it. And of course, you can skim through some of the definitions because you're not going to need that. And then on the local side, especially, they have a lot of just just admin documents you have to complete uh, to include the past performance. That's, you know, you showing references and past performance. And so when it comes to past performance in my course, if you join my program, um, you have access to my past performance. If you're in the same industry or similar industry to what my company Foresight Industries does, you have access to my past performance. That's your past performance. So we work that out and that's something that I include in my mentorship because I feel like it's important. You need a shot. You know what I'm saying? You need a, you need an alley oop to get to this money. So, you know, that's something that we offer. But even if it's an industry that I'm, that I'm not in, that I can't necessarily provide you past performance in, we can provide, we'll be a reference for your company. And that's also very, very important. And then you get to ask me questions throughout the whole program, you know, but throughout your whole solicitation process. You go through, you take my course, even if you're finished with the course, you have access to me for life. We family for life. You know what I'm saying? Because I want y'all to win. Anywho, going back to um, the bids. So the bids, you um, look at it, you review it, you put in all your information that you need to. And usually you have to fill it in paper um, or you have to submit it in person, mail, but hopefully it'll be email or through a portal. And it just depends. It literally depends on what state you're in. Some of these states are super innovative and there's nothing, you never have to submit it, um, hand deliver it, but there's somewhere you do. Um, and there's different crazy ways I've seen the submission process um, when it comes to hand delivering, like where they wanted 10 copies, where you had to stamp original on one and it had to be color and the rest could be black and white copies and a whole plethora of things. Um, but with that, you know, you just have to make sure that you are reading thoroughly so you can make time for submitting these opportunities. And, you know, sometimes they might come out with an addendum. And so with an addendum or an amendment, essentially those are the same thing. Um, they can come out with that at any time, even the day that is due. So you would have to make sure you pay attention to those because if you don't include the addendum or amendment in the whole proposal, then it's deemed what's called non-responsive and non-responsive means that you didn't follow their rules. And it sucks because you might put in all this work and because you didn't do the addendum, the, the fifth addendum that they had, you'll be deemed non-responsive. All that hard work is, is over with. One time there were, I did like an all nighter on, um, I had a subcontractor to do electrical work. He worked so hard to put that thing together. Um, well, the part that he needed to do and the pricing and everything. And I had to, I did an all nighter putting it together and they needed like five copies and a thumb and a thumb drive. And I forgot the thumb drive. Oh my God. We were non-responsive. I was sick. Oh, and it was worse because the guy was like, what in the world? And he never did contracting again. I feel so bad. Don't let anything like that keep you from doing government contracting again. We make mistakes. You know, I felt so bad. I should have lied. I should have been like, I don't know what happened. <laughs> it's not funny. Okay. Anyway, so with that, you know, you just have to pay attention to what they're asking. Because if you don't submit the right amount of copies, if it's a hand delivery or whatever, then you just wasted all of your time. And it's really, really frustrating. Um, so the bids is, you know, that's what a bid is. You're submitting your proposal or your number to the agency saying, I want to do this, this thing. And here's how much I'm going to charge. And here's how we're going to do it. That's essentially what it is. When people say bid on a contract bid, that's what they're talking about. Um, the next thing would be, you know, the actual contract. So let's just say you win. Woo! <laughs> You've been on it, you win, and now it's time for the contract. So make sure that your contract is in alignment with what the solicitation is. They be trying to pull a fast one sometimes, and you just have to make sure you understand what your contract says because 
yeah, whatever you put in the solicitation might be one thing, but when it comes to that contract, that's what you're bound to. And they will refer back to that contract and say, per the contract, you're supposed to do blah, 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 blah. You're like, I don't remember reading that. Make sure you read the contract before you sign it and send it back to the agency because that sometimes they will try to pull a fast one on you. And a lot of times these uh, contracts and solicitations are copy and paste from another agency, another project, and they have all kind of errors in there. I always call it find the error in the solicitation and in the contract. So pay attention to what you're signing because the government... These people are getting paid twice a month and they're still going to get paid whether you're there or not. It sucks, but this is what it is. And I want you to make money and not have to worry about making an error about something that you sign. And if you have team um, under your belt, make sure that they understand that too. That's super important too, because they might just have signing authority for your company and you're like, la, 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 you never read it. And they're like, oh, you're supposed to provide floor wax and services every month. And you know, that wasn't including your pricing. So now you're coming out of pocket and you didn't know and nobody read it, yada, yada, yada. So after you get the contract, then it's execution, right? So execution is should be flawless. I mean, there's not a whole lot to say about that, but it's time for you to perform. That you meaning yourself, and or your subcontractor that's now in the age of everybody getting into government contracting a lot of people are doing this set it and forget it and that's no bueno it hopefully it works out but these people are representing your business so make sure that they are legit make sure that they are your subcontractor is understands the mission they understand their pay nothing becomes more volatile than a relationship that they, there's no clear understanding of pay so they have to know what their pricing is you have to know what their pricing is the frequency how you're getting paid i mean there's some people who have never invoiced before ever um, or there might be a totally separate invoicing process for that agency that you're providing the service for. Um, so you just have to be really, really clear on that aspect, like what you need to do um, and try to get as clear as possible before you even sign that contract. So you need to execute and have your subcontractor execute flawlessly. Whatever the agency wants, pretty much, as long as it's not you know immoral or doesn't make any sense or not a part of the contract that's what the agency gets because they're the ones signing the check right so if you don't win one of the things that some people forget to do is ask for a debrief ask why you didn't win now on well federal and local they will you and corporate actually if you submit a quote or a proposal or anything um sometimes they'll send out everyone's pricing for everyone to see so with that, you might look at your price and you're like, oh Lord, I'm way higher than everyone else. My price is way more than every other person. So there's no need for me to ask for a debrief. But if it's an agency that, if it's something that they don't send out with the pricing and you're like, well, what is going on? Like who, who was awarded? It's been months. And you need to make sure that you ask for a debrief because that's only going to help you moving forward with future contracts. Like ask they're supposed to provide you usually they're not gonna they're not gonna do a phone call with you usually they're gonna do um an email they might call they're not gonna do an in-person usually i haven't i don't even know if i've ever seen an in-person especially now it's post covid um they usually send you an email or they'll call you and say oh your price was too high okay bye <laughs> not that quick but similar to that and or they might say you know you didn't have the past experience that we required or something you know so it's it's always something so you just have to have to ask for a debrief um and you might even have to do a protest and a protest means that somebody didn't do something right or somebody's giving someone a hookup and it ain't right so we need to evaluate this whole process and with a protest though you usually have to pay money so just keep that in mind too so you know is it worth the fight and sometimes you're like on to the next one it's not worth the fight so that's just kind of how that process works um and then of course when it comes to hiring um, whether you hire internally or subcontract it out, look, get, get good people, invest the money to get good people. Do not try to skip on that. I have a whole video about government contract and hiring. I'll leave a link in the description or put up the card. And that is a major factor of contracting that a lot of people don't talk about because they want to just set it and forget it. But 
You have to have good people because they represent your brand. And if you want to be in business for longer than a day, your brand is everything. You want to get to a point where you don't have to bid and people will call you because they know your reputation. They know that you're exceptional at what you do. So you want to have good people and people that understand the mission and that will ride for you in your business. They, no one cares about your business more than you. So you have to create a culture or at least have some subcontractors that can you know, wave your flag when you're not there. And that sometimes that takes a little bit of time. You gotta weed through the bad people, weed through family members, weed through you know the ones, the naysayers or whomever. If you have someone that you know is not good, you're thinking about hiring them, don't. Like people will say, oh, I'm gonna hire my lazy son or my lazy brother to do it because he ain't he ain't about nothing anyway, or they're not um good at working anyway but then you're gonna hire them for your company that makes no sense like that makes no sense do not strain your relationship with a friend or a family member because of contracting because it will get strained it will get rough there will be times that you all are stressed hopefully not but there will be times where it may not be as fun and you have to ensure that you are taking care of your own business because at the end of the day nobody cares about it more than you and you want your money so I just wanted to give like a quick overview of if you are brand new to government contracting. I know that even though it was 30 minutes, I know it was like a fire hose of information, but I do have plenty of other videos where I go more into depth about each of these topics. Um, and I also have a course where I teach you about government contracting, federal, local, and then about corporate contracting. I also have a separate section for my veterans. And if you're, a br you're brand new, you're here, you're watching this video, startup section within the course as well. And you have unlimited access to ask me questions and schedule calls and go line by line on contracts or solicitations that you have questions about. So that's something that I offer um, mentorship within the course and you have forever access to the course. Forever. We together forever. Like I want y'all to win. That's my main mission is more successful stories and I want more people to win. Um, we also have our GovCon Moneymakers community, which is 100% free and we have almost a thousand people in there now. It might be over a thousand by the time you see this video. At the making of this video, it's almost a thousand people um, where we share um, information, resources, uh, share our wins, and also people are starting to do business together. So that's what it's all about. You know what I'm saying? It's a community. There's more than enough money to go around for all of us. So uh, until next time, this is your favorite veteran.